if you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 35, and we'll begin reading in verse 13. Genesis chapter 35, beginning in verse 13. The Bible says, And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And Jacob set a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. Then Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed, and she had, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is in which is Bethlehem. I'd like to preach the Lord be my helper this morning on the thought I didn't plan to die today. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your watch care. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and grace. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you place on our lives every day. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace that you provide. Lord, we pray this morning that you would honor your word. Lord, you promised to do that. And Lord, we pray that you'd stir up those that are here that love you and that honor you. And that you put in them a desire to serve you even more. And Lord, for the lost, that you might speak life to them. Lord, today would be the day of salvation for them. And that they might look on you as the only answer to sin. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, I want to point out a few things about Rachel before we really get into the text. And the first thing is this. Rachel was a type of the flesh. She was not the chosen wife. She was not God's pick for, for, uh, for Jacob at all. But rather, he, she was the one that he picked. And I also want you to see concerning Rachel, if you know your Bible, she ran down to meet him and she fixed things for him, but that doesn't mean she was the pig. She was a fake. Uh, in other words, you can look the part and not be real. That was Rachel. That's who she was. Also, she would not give up her father's gods. You know, what I found through the years serving God is this. You will give up something for Him. Uh, he takes that as honor. He takes that as recognition. Amen. He takes that as that you're serious with Him. And when they were leaving Laban's house, what they were really to do was to leave the gods of, these world, of this world behind and embrace the great God Jehovah. But she would not do that. She liked to cling on to the flesh. Uh, verse 13, And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. Now, first of all, in verse 13, I want you to see that God comes and leaves as He wills, not as you will. They had had time to pray together. They had time to meet in community, giving great promises that nations would come out of Him. But when God was God, done, He withdrew Himself. You don't force God to do anything. Uh, it's an impossibility. You know what? That's why it's rich when God really blesses you. And when you work it up in the flesh, there's nothing that comes out of it. Because you can't demand of God, nor will you ever be able to demand of God. And so God left, so it was time for Jacob to move on. Uh, verse 14, And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he, caught, where he talked with him, meaning God, even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering upon that upon their own, and he poured all their own. So I want you to see that uh, that Jacob sets up this stone, and he makes recognition that he had met with God. You know, any time when when you meet with God and He meets with you, it ought to be a time that's recognized in your life. Uh, sadly to say, most of us, the only time we really recognize. 
us is when the Lord Jesus saves our soul. But there should be events all down through your life where you say, there's where I met with God. He encouraged me there. He brought me to my knees there. He, he, he filled my soul here. All down through the life. And what I found among most believers, if you ask them, uh, when has the Lord blessed you? They'll come up with salvation. And then maybe their children. And then maybe the provision of a house. But as far as really meeting with God, they don't have a whole lot to add with that. And so when He does meet with you, recognize it. When He does meet with you, remember it. Give Him some honor for it because it's at His discretion and not yours. Verse 15. And Jacob called the name, uh, the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel, or God's with us, or the place of God. Verse 16. And they journeyed from Bethel... And there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. Now, I want you to see a, a couple of things. I personally believe, if you can look at it without a free will mentality, that this was Rachel's last opportunity. This was her last opportunity to mean business with God. It was her last opportunity. You know what? She didn't expect to die while having Benjamin. She didn't anticipate that death was coming her way. She thought she had other opportunities further down the road. But the reality was is that she didn't. You know what? I don't know when I'm going to die, but separate and apart from catching away, I will die. And you know what? More than that, you will too. Every one of us will, will come to that place. And most of us, you know, don't say, well, you know what? Uh, we can no more plan to die than we can plan to be born. Uh, the, the, the subject of, a, of a, a natural birth is in the hands of your parents. It doesn't have anything to do with you. And, and, and justly so, the subject in the time of your death has nothing to do with you. It's appointed of God. It's going to come His way at His time and when He is ready. And so we see that, that Rachel missed a great opportunity to honor God and to get those idols out of her life. But she didn't, uh, she didn't uh, elect to do that. Now, they were headed to Ephrath, but they didn't make it. Now, I don't know how far Ephrath is from where uh, the place of God is, but they never got there. You know what? I bet Rachel thought about buying some things for the baby at Ephrath. I, I bet she thought about it would be better to have this child in the city than it is out here in the campground. I bet she thought that, you know what? I can't wait that this baby's born so it's another slap at Leah. Because that's how she viewed her children. And, and, and so I want you to see she had some plans but they just didn't come to pass. She had an appointment she was going to keep. She, she, she had an event in her life that was unavoidable and that, that, that she would be with, uh, that she would uh, meet God that very day. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. Now, this, uh, this word travail means trouble. It, it means the upsetting. And then it says she had hard labor. There, there, there's really two different words. Do you know what the Bible says? I think it's in 1 Thessalonians. That uh, women that put God first, their labors are not as hard. It, really, it, it says that. Uh, I'll find the, the correct wording after services this morning, but uh, it says she shall be saved in childbearing is the way the words uh, are, are put. So the only thing I can, I can come to that Rachel wasn't this brand of woman because the Bible said she had hard labor. She had difficulty. She, and listen, I've never been in labor. I know no, no time is it a piece of cake. But I, I, I think it was worse on Rachel. It was hard. It was difficult. You know what? When we have hard, difficult times, it should be a wake up from God. But most of the time, we ignore it. Most of the time, uh, oh, it's just one of those things. I'm sick today. I don't feel well. And, and so I want you to see, even as things were 
declining, Rachel did not give God the, the, the honor. As, as she was approaching death, and, and no doubt this was a different labor than the first labor she experienced with, uh, with Joseph. And still, she did not honor God. She didn't seek out to God. She didn't call upon God. She didn't see anything in the necessity of that. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. Now, uh, I'm assuming the baby was born or very near to be born because this midwife knew the sex of the child already. They, she knew that it was going to be a little boy. Now, I want you to see the advice of the midwife is fear not. You know what that tells me? That she was afraid. She was fearful. Now, I guess the midwife assumed that she thought the baby was going to die. So she said, don't you fear about this baby. But I believe Rachel's real problem is she was fearful of death, period. That, that she was unsettled and death was approaching. And all she had was those idols that she had hid in her stuff. And all she had to depend on was Laban's pagan religion. And now death was approaching. You know what? She didn't plan to die. And I really believe even as it was coming... It still was not quite a reality to her. You know what? I, I've seen people literally in the throngs of death and not even acknowledge the God of the Bible. That you know why? Because God hadn't opened his eyes. I mean, opened their eyes to him. And so, as we see that Rachel's dying uh, with uh, uh, with her her usual uh, lack of reverence to God. Uh, she, she doesn't acknowledge him in any way. Verse 18, And it came to pass as her soul was in departing. Now that's the very unusual words, as her soul was in departing. You know what? That says to me somehow that was a process and she was in the process of her soul departing. You know what? One day you're going to be in the process of your soul departing and you're going to know it's happening. Your soul in departing. That ought to shake us up this morning. And that ought to tear us up from the inside out. That we're going to be aware when we're leaving this place. We're going to understand, hey, the gig's up. We're about done. I'm fixing to fly out of here. Her soul was in departing. You know, uh, if you've ever flown, I, I've flown a lot now. And... Once you're going down that runway, it's not coming back. Right. I mean, they'll hit in the jet engines and you're going forward. And one day you will leave this place. Separate and apart, the returning of Christ, death is coming. Rachel didn't plan for it. She didn't think it was going to be that day. You know what? I bet, I bet when she woke up and labored her, she was thinking, by the end of this day, I'll be holding me another son. By the end of this day, I'll be nursing and giving life. By the end of this day, I'll have another one up on Leah. But she died. Death wasn't planned for, but it did happen. And, and, and many times we don't anticipate uh, what, what is spread before us. So no doubt then what we really need to do is certainly be prepared when, for this event to come. Notice I want you to see true to her form. That, for she died that she called, the, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Now, I want you to see, even, even in her death, she says, that's the child of my sorrow. That, that's the one that called me grief. That's what it means, child of sorrow or child of grief. And he is the problem. No, the reason that she died in grief was herself. The way that she had lived, the, her lack of knowledge of the true God, 
She died in sorrow just because of self. And you know what? One day, you may die in sorrow just because of yourself. I remember uh, when I was a kid, the first person that I saw immediately before death was a neighbor man. He bought my great grandmother's place, and my grandmother, uh, my grandmother's house was right beside them. He just bought the little strip that made up her house, and the farm went to Don Trewick. But I want you to see that in this little spot of spot of land, uh, and I, I just remember waking up, and there and an, two ambulances being there, and I didn't know what was happening. But what had happened, the man next door came over and he was shouting. He was calling out to my mother from the yard. And she said she barely heard him because he was so overcome with this pain. He didn't have a telephone, so he was wanting mom to call for some help. And I do remember this, it's a very unusual thing. It, it really stuck with me. It made death real to me because anybody when they're having a heart attack, and that's what took him, was they sweat profusely. And uh, he sweated. There's great big drops of sweat on my grandmother's concrete porch. And it stained it. And I don't think it ever came out. I remember Nanny scrubbing, scrubbing, scrubbing. And then it would dry away. It would get dry and you could still see those faint marks in there. So, you know what? I bet when Mr. Birds woke up this mor that morning... He didn't plan to die. He bought one other little strip. He bought the strip where, where Granny's house was. And then he bought a little tiny strip on the creek. Now he was in his 70s when he moved here from Chicago. And he was growing marijuana down on my grandmother, great grandmother's place. Uh, of course we didn't know that until he died. And they thought that he was raising corn. Uh, <clears throat> but he didn't plan that, that day that he died, he went down there and hoped his marijuana out. But when he got home, things changed, didn't he? I do remember this, and I never, I never will uh, know for sure, maybe in eternity, I think I'll be so consumed by the person of Christ, I won't care then. But I've often wondered, because he cried out to God, I'm hurting so bad, God help me. But was he crying out for the pain? Or did he cry out because he saw the end was coming? See, death is coming. Death is a reality. And then, uh, many of you know, Leon Hollis, he worked the call, and I didn't know it for almost 20 years later. And he said about the time that they got to the county line, he'd give up the ghost. That was it. He was done. See, the, the, the reality is, he woke up to hold, to hold out his marijuana crop, and that night he went home to be, uh, went out into eternity. I don't know if he went home to be with the Lord or not. You know what I find a lot of these deathbed religions is this, that instead of God speaking life to them, they're just fearful of hell. It ain't necessarily a bad thing. We all fear hell. But at the same time, that doesn't mean life's been spoken to. You see the difference? And, and, and so we see that Rachel was unprepared probably. She, she took anger at the baby's son. She, she wanted him to be called sorrowful. And, and what the real problem was is she was sorrowful. What the real problem was is she needed some help. The baby didn't need no help. She needed help. And so, uh, so he, uh, he calls him Benjamin. Which means child of my old age. Now that's a big difference than saying child of my sorrow. See, they viewed them differently. Uh, Rachel viewed him one way and Jacob viewed him another. So we see then death is coming whether you plan for it or not. Death is a very, very real reality and it does come. Verse 21 I find very interesting. In Israel journeyed I want you to notice two things. He's called Jacob in verse 20. And he's called Israel in verse 21. See, he needed to get rid of some things to be recognized as Israel. And she was one of them. Her pagan gods, before he could recognize himself and be recognized as Israel, that problem had to be getting, gotten out of the way. Remember, as Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, he brought a problem with him that his name was Lot. 
and Lot had to be gotten out of the way. So we need as the Lord's people to be very aware of the people that we allow into our lives and people that become assimilated to us because they may be a problem too. And more than that, we need to be certain that we've been redeemed. We need to know that salvation has come to our house. And, and you know, uh, I believe it is whenever the Philippian jailer uh, was saved, he said, in this day has salvation come to my house. You know what? A lot of people say it's because all his people were saved. I don't necessarily believe that because I remember the day when salvation came to this house. We let, we dwell in a house of clay for a very short time and I remember when he came to dwell with me. My question is do you remember when he came to dwell with you? Uh, and if you don't, you have a real problem. If you don't, there's something wrong. Now, go with me to Acts chapter number 6. We're going to read of a death of another individual. Acts chapter 6 verse number 5. Acts 6 and verse 5, the Bible says, And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Par Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Now, what they were doing, they were choosing these twelve, or these seven rather, that would be over the serving of the people. Uh, they are a type of a deacon, and they were giving them jobs to do. And I want you to see the information concerning Stephen. It's very more detailed than the rest. He says, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith. You know, what a wonderful blessing it is to be said of you, well, he was full of faith. Now, I want you to say to see what it doesn't say. It didn't say that it was full of the faith. The faith is the oracles handed down to God. Knowing good things about the Scripture. Knowing what the doctrine of salvation is about. Knowing what the church is about. All those things are wonderful, good, and have their place. But this says that he was full of faith, which is trust in God. Do you trust God has your provision at hand? He does. Do you trust Him implicitly even if Hillary Clinton becomes the leader of our nation? God help us. Do you trust that? I do. We need to be full of faith. If the bank account's empty, do you trust Him? You ought to be full of faith. I don't know how me and my family would eat, but I do believe this, that He would provide. I ain't going to say your name. Most of you would know this lady if I told you. Uh, she had four children. And uh, she was married, but they always had a pretty rough time of it. And she told me this story that, that one time she had prepared for her four children. There was nothing to set out, nothing to be done, nothing uh, to cook. It was all gone. And she lived in a little house. And there was, a, there was another trailer down from her where TVA men worked and lived and, and they abided there and the outage was out and this man it just so happens got canned and so he took all the food he had left in his little house before going back to Alabama and said here you are I don't want this to go to waste you know what that's provision of God it would take a whole lot of trust to, to believe that, would not it? it, it would, and when, when there's nothing left in the pantry, no, no, no seemingly means of survival, then he comes in. Stephen had that brand of faith. Then secondly, it says, uh, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Now, to have that connection there, it's full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. The, you, that, that's why the and is in there. Full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. You know what? I understand the abiding presence of the Holy Ghost and, and His simplistic leading in our lives, but there are times when we're closer than others. You cannot tell me you're full of the Holy Ghost at all times because that would be a lie. You know why? Because every one of us in the sound of my voice has been cold far from the things of God. 
And the only retrieving of that is when the Holy Spirit comes to you, just like he did Elijah up on the mountain, and said, what, what are you doing here? What doest thou, Elijah? Why did you give up? Why aren't you down there fighting Jezebel and the others? Why, why are you up here out of the battle? See, that's what the Holy Spirit does for us, the Holy Ghost. So this man, Stephen, was on the ball, and because he was on the ball, he was given a, a great and wonderful job to do that the others did not, uh, that the others uh, did not have. Now drop with me down uh, to verse 8. Verse 8 of the same chapter. And Stephen, full of faith and power. Now again, I want you to see that it's noted of him that he was full of faith. Again, it doesn't say the faith. Uh, it, doesn't, it, isn't talking about, it isn't talking about good sound doctrine. It was just that he had an unusual dependence on God. Whatever God brought his way, he knew God would help him through it. That he, he was the presence that he needed. And so it says that he was full of faith and power. Are you a powerful Christian? Now, what, I'll tell you another thing it doesn't say about Stephen. It doesn't say that he was an apostle. And you know why? Because there was no one dead yet for him to fill that office. Now, I think he had the, authority, he had the credentials of an apostle, but he just never became an apostle. So it says he's full of faith and power. So he's a regular, everyday member of First Baptist Jerusalem, and he was full of power. What about you? Are you full of power? And listen, that doesn't mean authority, because no man has authority except God. So you know what that, that means? He was full of power. He was full of strength. He was full of ability. He could get the job done. And, and we look around us today and we see all these old weak, anemic Christians doing nothing for the cause of Christ and wringing their hands wondering what's going to happen next and then blaming all that on the day in which we live. Is that not what you see? Stephen wasn't that brand. He was full of faith. And he's full of power. And I believe we can be empowered today. I believe we still have the same ability that we can be strong. Uh, we can have that zeal. We can have that power that Stephen did. So it was noted that he, he had this power. Did great, uh, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And, and, and so we see he was that kind of brand of person. Now drop with me over uh, to Acts 7, verse 48. Now, if you want to be a man or a lady, because <laughs> ladies can be full of faith and have powerful lives too. Beware because the devil's got his beat on you. Beware because Satan doesn't like that. He's not impressed. It makes him angry. It makes him mad. He gets angry about it. At 7 and verse 48, Stephen is pre preaching. He says, How be it the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house shall you build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Now, a couple of things there. What Stephen was doing is he was saying this building means nothing. This temple at Jerusalem is a scam. It is a waste of time. Listen, you have no, you don't have any business putting confidence in this building. And listen, that set the Jews on fire. It made them upset. They didn't want to hear about a people that could worship God without a building. They didn't want to hear about a people that the, that the individuals themselves made up the church or the assembly. They didn't want to hear about any of that. And they took it as a direct insult. You know what? Good buildings are fine. But they're just not the church. And if things keep going the way they are, we, we ain't going to have anywhere to meet anyway. So we see then that, that Stephen kind of lays it on the line and it really skimmed and hurt. And the reason it hurt so bad, he was saying your altars are useless. The holies of holies 
It's wrecked. It's not there anymore. All this stuff is a waste of time. And it upset them so they did not know what to do. And, and, and that was the kind of voice that Stephen had. That's the kind of man he was. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do, all, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your father did, as your fathers did, so do ye. Now, that was stated. You know what? Sometimes we just need to hear it like it is. I, I, I'm kind of tired of preachers that sugarcoat, ain't you? Of course, I guess y'all don't have to worry about it much, right? But you, you go around and you hear things and you just go, won't he just say it? I know what you're saying at, but just say it. You know, uh, don't, don't, don't talk about homosexuals. Say, listen, they're sodomites, and if God don't intervene, they're on their way to a devil's hell. Just say it like it is, and then you don't have to worry. See, that's the kind of man Stephen was. He didn't get around the bush. He didn't beat it. He said, listen, this temple means nothing, and you need God. You need redemption. That's what he said. That's the kind of preachers we need. You, you, you want some ointment to get you through the last days? That's the ointment you need. You don't need somebody sitting back and telling you and telling how good you are and afraid to call sin, sin, and, and, and just going through a routine. You need to hear from God. That's the kind of man Stephen was. Verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Now, two things, they were cut to the heart. They brought it right down to where it was. Now, I will say something else. <clears throat> it did not say that the Holy Ghost moved them. It did not say that God spoke to them. They were cut to their heart. Which means that this hit home. This is sin. This is a problem. And then it says they gnashed on Him with their teeth. A lot of people says, well, they spoke back to Him. Only problem is, the Bible don't say they spoke back to them. They did it. You ever been bit? It hurts really bad. We had one bite, and that was Adam. He loved to ride on your shoulder, and you get him up there, and he would bite the fire out of you. I've had my shoulder bleed from it. You know how I broke Adam? I got his arm one day and bit him back. He never bit me again. That's what they did to him. They did. They were so upset about the truth that he was preaching, they literally bit him. And you don't think it can happen again? Sure it can. You know what? They were full of, they were full of devils, no doubt. And, and devils don't get no new ideas. So sure they can bite us again. Sure it can happen just in that way. And so <clears throat> the sermon was so direct and so specific and so pointed that they literally bit him in, 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 what, in what he had to say. Verse 55. But he, meaning Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, which is Jesus, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And so he looks up and he sees the full Godhead. He sees the Father for who He is. He sees Jesus for who He is. And he makes mention of it. You know, sometimes when we make mention of our, of our experience with Christ, people get really angry. They really get upset. They really get mad. But that's okay. Verse 56, And behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped up their ears and ran upon Him with one accord. Now one thing, little bitty tiny thing, I have in common with Stephen is I've seen people stop up their ears when they break off, when they quit listening. And listen, it's always when it don't feel right. You know what? I've been putting some stuff on the book at a friend challenge me to put 10 days of Scripture on. You know what? Everybody's like, going, hey, man, brother, like me. Oh, this is so great. Until I put, until I posted that a man, a woman is not to wear that that appertaineth unto a man. You know what? I, I got about nine lights and I had to ask for it. You know why? Because it burns going. 
That, that, that's a truth that's not popular today. But nonetheless, it, it, it is truth. And it is something that we... And, and so, as, as Stephen is, is about to die, he sees the situation for what it is, and, and he, 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 he lets them know very quickly, <laughs> and then they stop up their ears. You know who helps you stop up your ears? The devil. Now, uh, all of us have stuffy ears from time to time. Allergies and earwax and all that good stuff, right? With stuffy ears spiritually too. Ain't nothing like quite like the feeling when you're preaching and you see that cut off in their face. Like, okay, that one's turned me off. People can still do that, you know? And, and I, I see people do it all the time. And, and, and that's okay. But listen, they are still responsible for what is preached to them. They're still accountable for the truth that they do receive. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped up their ears and ran upon him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus. Receive my spirit. Now that's... When Stephen woke up that day, he didn't plan for that, did he? I bet when he woke up, he thought, well, you know what? I'm going down to the synagogue and I'm going to preach Christ and Him crucified. I'm going to preach the fact that Christ is Christ. I, I, I might even tell them a little bit about that useless temple they're still going into. I might tell them that. But I bet he didn't say, you know what? It would be really nice if they'd get angry at me and they'd start throwing stones at me and I would die today. Stephen wasn't planning for that. But you know what? He died. He got up that morning and he was dead by night. See, you just don't know. We think we know. We hold on to our youth. We say, oh, you know, I at least got another 20 years or something. You just don't know that. Death will come when it's supposed to. And, and when it comes, that'll be it. And you know what? I, I see, I've seen a lot of people go seemingly at a, an untimely age as a result of accidents or whatever, but they took the Lord Jesus. It didn't take Him by surprise. Final place, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. This is the kind of individual I want to be. <clears throat> Luke, chapter 2, verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same came, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for, for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. You, you see a, do you see a similarity with him and Stephen? Two things, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. That was their similarities. Do you see a difference? It did not say that the Holy Ghost was on uh, Rachel, did it? Now, which way do you want to die? Which way do you want to end this thing up? Which way do you want in finishing your course? Because your course will be complete one day. Verse 26, And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit unto the temple. Now I want you to see, he was looking for the consolation of Israel. He was looking for the return uh, to, to the prophet that would come. He was looking for the Christ that would be revealed. And it said that he came, by the, he came to the temple by the Spirit. You know what I wonder about Simeon? If he just got about sick of going down to the house of God and God not being. You know, sometimes it gets pretty, pretty dry, don't it? Sometimes it gets pretty difficult. But I want you to see that, that Simeon was so in tune to the Holy Ghost, he went on down to the temple. 
And you know what? It may not have been temple time. That was usually at 6 in the morning and 6 in the evening. Now these circumcisions that were fixing to be done, they happen in midday. Not a, not a regular time to be meeting. But the Holy Spirit said, you go on down to the house of God. And He did. Have you ever thought about it in this meeting that's coming up? If the Lord Jesus, the Holy Ghost, would say, "Listen, you need to go down there to that temple, uh, that building, and pray that God might meet with us. Pray that God uh, might might bless New Testament Church. Maybe pray that maybe there would be an awakening in this last day. You know what? If the Holy Ghost says that, you need to do it. You need to follow through." Go about the building and begin to pray that God might meet with us in this place. And I fully believe that He will. Verse 28. We read the rest of verse 27. And when the parents brought in chi the child Jesus to do, after, to do for Him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his hands and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Now, when did Simeon die? I don't know. Never records that. But I do know this, he was ready. He says, I'm satisfied now, Lord. Take me on home. You promised. You fulfill, I'm ready. Now the, pro the question I have, are you a Simeon? Are you a Stephen? Are you a Rachel? Which one are you? are you? Are you ready? Are you going to be embittered at death? Are you going to be fearful of death? Are you going to be like Simeon and say, let, let, let thy servant depart in peace, I'm ready. Uh, you promised it to me, I've seen it, I'm ready to go. I want to be a Simeon. I want to say, even so unto me, Lord Jesus. I'm ready. I'm done. I'm finished. That, you know what? There's a great peace to abide there. There's a great blessing. You don't have to you don't have to fear going down the road. You don't have to fear if the doctor says, yeah, it's cancer. Just dwell the peace of God. Even so, Lord Jesus. You know, a lot of times I hear the verse quoted, even so come, Lord Jesus. And I really wonder how many people mean that. How many people are, are really ready? How many people are really ready to see the Lord Jesus face to face? Oh, what a blessed time that's going to be. I hope you all will